Well, welcome everyone uh, to this Zoom meeting of the Hoover Institution's Economic Policy Working Group. Looking forward to it. The focus today is a very important topic, which we've called the exodus of firms from California, facts, reasons, and solutions. And we're very grateful to have two uh, distinguished experts discuss this important issue. Eleni Gonalakis is, of course, the Lieutenant Governor of the great state of California. She was formerly ambassador to Hungary and former president of a great real estate development firm right here in California. I was fascinated to, that she traveled, I guess as part of the campaign, you gotta do this to all of the counties in California, all 58. And I looked up, that includes the smallest one, which is Alpine with barely a thousand people to Los Angeles County with nearly 10 million. So it's, it's really great. Ellie went to uh, Dartmouth uh, and also to the business school at UC Berkeley. So, so welcome. And I want to also introduce Lee Ohanian. Lee is a professor of economics uh, at the University of California at Los Angeles. He's also a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution right here at Stanford. Lee attended college at the University of California, Santa Barbara, got his PhD from University of Rochester. And he's written extensively about the state, by the state of California, as, and as a frequent contributor to the Hoover website, California on your mind. So we're gonna start with the Lieutenant Governor and um, she will make a presentation. I'll ask some questions and then Lee will make a presentation. I'll ask some questions too. And then we'll have time for questions and answers from all of you uh, to, uh, to both uh, Lieutenant Governor and to Lee. If you'd like to ask a question, you can use the mechanical hand uh, or you can just signal on the chat room and then I'll call on you. So uh, let's get started. Uh, Lieutenant Governor Kunalakis, could you begin? And uh, we'll get started with this great show. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Professor Taylor, and to everyone at the Hoover Institution for inviting me to be here with you today. Uh, full disclosure, John's invitation came via my husband, Dr. Marcus Kunalakis, who's a visiting fellow at Hoover. Uh, as a journalist and foreign policy analyst, Marcus really tries to stay clear of the partisan fray. Uh, this is something both Hoover and I probably make difficult for him but he truly values his affiliation with Hoover. And, you know, really I was just delighted to accept your invitation. Great. Thank I you. think the title of today's conversation is somewhat provocative, the exodus of firms in California, reality, solutions, and, and reasons. And I thought I'd take these questions one at a time, starting with reality. There are a lot of anecdotes and stories out there right now, but as my friend and mentor Nancy Pelosi would say, the plural of anecdote is not data. But still, I was alarmed as many were by last month's headlines announcing a string of high profile departures. Hewlett Packard, Oracle, Charles Schwab and Elon Musk all made splashy announcements that they were leaving and that the primary reason was that it's too difficult to do business in California. I was also alarmed because I live in San Francisco and I come from a real estate background. So many of my friends were calling me with stories of families selling homes and leaving San Francisco, citing high taxes and quality of life issues like homelessness. These stories were especially worrisome to me because while I'm not an economist, as John mentioned, I do have an MBA from UC Berkeley. And it's hard to avoid the fact that our state's general fund is very dependent on tax payments of those at the top. There are different ways to quantify this, but 45% of our general fund comes from the personal income tax payments of the top 1% of California taxpayers. Our budget also benefits from windfalls that come when companies go public. This is another major vulnerability if the anecdotes of companies leaving the state truly add up to an exodus. Before I get to the good news, let me just cite one more data point. In December, the California Department of Finance 
released statistics for the period between July 2019 and July 2020. During this period, population growth was only 0.05%. It is the lowest rate of growth since the year 1900. I'm sure that Professor Ohanian will give us more things to worry about and might mention California's regulatory environment, but let me share with you some of the information that makes me a little less worried than I was even just a month ago. First, when we look at our flat growth rate, we have to consider that while it reflects people departing California, it also reflects lower immigration numbers. I'm a former US ambassador and for almost four years, I had a consular section in my embassy. In my current job, I'm the state's representative for international affairs and trade development. So I have followed closely the anti-immigrant rhetoric and anti-immigrant policies of the Trump administration. Between Donald Trump and COVID-19, immigration into the US is way down because about one in four immigrants into the US come to California, our growth rate has almost certainly been impacted by this trend. Next, I'd like to point to a recent study by the US Postal Service. By analyzing change of address forms filed by San Francisco residents in 2020, the USPS found that about 40% of people who moved went somewhere else in San Francisco. Of the 60% who left San Francisco, most went to other Bay Area counties or further south to Los Angeles and San Diego. In fact, the top 15 counties where people moved when they left San Francisco last year were all in California. Another recent study is the Joint Venture Silicon Valley Annual Index. Their data showed that the growth of the workforce in the Silicon Valley was flat. Didn't go up, didn't go down. So not much of an exodus when you look at that, at least not yet. By the way, the index also revealed that the market cap for Silicon Valley companies grew 37% last year, which is not surprising with the stock market hitting all time highs. So also at an all time high are housing prices in our state. The median home price in California rose 17% last year. Executives at Lennar, the state's largest home builder, tell me they are having their best year ever for new home sales. You might've noticed that seasonal tourist spots like Lake Tahoe, Napa, and the Coachella Valley, it's nearly impossible to find a vacation rental. It's hard to square the idea of an exodus with the image of people in a frenzied rush to snap up California real estate at record prices. Talking about housing in California is a good place to address John's second topic, reasons why companies might be leaving the state. I do think there is a towering challenge that we have in our state. That is the cost of housing. I spent 18 years in the housing industry and have been concerned about this for a long time. The median home price in California is now $720,000. In Texas, the median home price is $270,000. In conversations I have with business people, this issue comes up more often than tax rates or the regulatory environment. And when we turn to the final topic of today's conversation, solutions, let me just start by saying that for the long-term health of our society, our economy, and our environment, we must address the twin crises of housing and homelessness. Maybe, John, you can invite me back for a longer discussion just about that. But for now, I'd like to borrow a line from Governor Newsom that he borrows from Bill Clinton. There is nothing wrong with California that can't be fixed by what is right with California. Our golden state is home to more engineers, more scientists, more researchers, and more Nobel Prize laureates than anywhere else in the nation. There are nearly 3 million students currently enrolled in our public university system, 
educating the workforce of the future. It's also worth noting, we are first in the country in two-way trade, first in manufacturing, and that the ports of Long Beach and Los Angeles make up the largest port complex in North America. We're also the largest consumer market in the country and number one by far in access to capital. Forbes magazine recently published a list of the 100 fastest growing companies in the world and 20 of them are headquartered in our state, which reminds me that when we look at that 1% of Californians whose personal income tax makes up 45% of our general fund, the individuals who make those payment, it turns out, are always changing. It's referred to as churn. Companies leave California, individuals leave, yes, some to avoid taxes, but new companies are born here all the time and new millionaires are minted at a record pace. This gets me to my favorite topic, California's open and welcoming society. People are sometimes surprised when they hear that 27% of Californians are foreign born. The national average is about 14%. This might also interest you. The Public Policy Institute of California reports that 72% of Californians have a positive view of immigrants because of their hard work and job skills. Only 23% think immigrants are a burden and 84% of Californians believe undocumented Californians should be able to stay permanently. I myself am the daughter of an immigrant. My grandmother never learned to read or write. My father started out as a farm worker right here outside of Lodi. And in one generation, the president of the United States sent me back to Europe as an American ambassador. Every day I meet people like me making their way down the pathway of the California dream. Let me wrap up with a few final thoughts on solutions. Donald Trump made no secret of his disdain for our state and among the many actions of his administration which harmed us disproportionately was the elimination of state and local tax deductions. I hope that the Biden-Harris administration will restore them. The nation relies on California's economic success and the federal government should not do things to harm us, regardless of which party is in power. Staying for a moment on the issue of taxes, the governor has been very clear that he has no intention of signing a wealth tax and often cites the fact that the last time our state raised income taxes was by a vote of the people in 2012. Up. The rest of my remarks have lost. Hold on. You know what? I don't need. I don't uh, need that. Other than just to cite uh, that our state, over the course of the last year during this unprecedented global pandemic, we have flattened the curve. We have vaccinated, begun vaccinating our people. And of course, we are desperately trying to get our students back in school. We also have a $15 billion budget surplus, which the governor has used to replenish our rainy day fund, pay down pension obligations, take care of those among us who are the most in need, and to help small and medium-sized businesses get back on their feet. So with that, John, I look forward to our conversation. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you so much. And uh, the statistics and the facts are, are most welcome as are some of the reasons and the solutions. So, so thank you for that. I, I think I'd like to start with a question about education. Um, you're on the Board of Regents uh, for the UC system, the Board of Trustees for the state system, state, and, and also the, the Board of Governors for the California Community Colleges. And in many respects, that is what has made California so outstanding, those schools. And so the question really is uh, related to your presentation. Are there things that you think California could be doing to maybe improve access uh, to these to these schools and make sure they maintain their 
importance? I, so thank you for asking. Education is very much a focus of my office, part of the reason why uh, I ran. Um, as I mentioned, uh, public higher education in this state has been absolutely essential to me and to my family. And as I travel the state and talk to students, um, all the time, I'm talking to kids whose parents did not, uh, in some cases, even, you know, go past eighth grade. Uh, and so the opportunity that we have with this next generation of students is really astonishing. If you look at the makeup of our CSU, about 30% of our students are the first in their family to go to college. At the UC, it's even higher. About 40% of UC students are the first in their family to go to college. Uh, we also uh, know that about 70, 75% of the students in the CSU, and this is about 450,000 students, about 70 to 75% are from underrepresented communities, students of color. So when I go on Zooms with students or visit them in per person, what uh, I see is a patchwork of kids from uh, immigrant communities that have come to California from around the world. It is pretty incredible. And it gives us an edge uh, to be able to use our public higher education system in order to educate the workforce of the future and be ready so that the companies that are still here in our state, and there are many, uh, are able to, uh, to pull their workforce from uh, the students right here in California. There's a lot of work that needs to be done. And uh, again, John, this could be a conversation for an entire yeah. uh, entire uh, uh, conference. Uh, but as I have um, tried to dig in a little about what's going on in our public higher education system, there um, are too many instances where the process to transfer from community college into the CSU, the UC, or a private college is very cumbersome, very difficult. It's very hard for students to know how to navigate it. The average transfer from community college generally has far more credits than they actually need, but along the way weren't entirely sure which courses that they needed to take. There's a lot of room for standardization of courses so that uh, a course taught at one community college uh, that's the same as a course taught at another community college have the name numbers, the same numbers. These are really simple things that can go a long way. You also have to look at our graduation rates at our CSU and our UCs. <clears throat> Marcus and I have two kids. One uh, is a freshman at Stanford. The other one is applying to go to college next year. Uh, it's really unthinkable that for them and for most of their friends, that it will take them more than four years to get through, uh, to get through college. They're called four-year universities, but the four-year graduation rate at our CSU is still only around 26%, and that's after 26%, right? One in four kids going to a CSU graduates in four years. So we have a lot of work there, a lot of opportunity, uh, but I will tell you there is no more inspiring place uh, policy-wise to spend your time than trying to figure out how to get these first-gen kids through our system of public higher education. Uh, and we know the outcome again with so many uh, successful examples of story, you know, stories of, of examples of kids who've made it through our system uh, who go far beyond the dreams of their parents uh, or grandparents who immigrated here. Thank you. Another question is about the housing, which you mentioned is such a big factor. And uh, people have pointed to land use regulations as part of the issue of you know, the Bay Area. People commute long distances. They park their trailers in El Camino. Uh, and it's, it's symbolic that maybe we need to do some reforms on land use. Uh, could you say a little bit about that uh, issue? John, um... The, the real conundrum with housing is that people want affordable housing uh, very often for themselves or for their employees, but individuals who have a home are not necessarily so keen on anyone moving in next door. 
Um, so that I think is putting it diplomatically. Uh, but this, um, there, there is almost a, a stalemate. Um, and uh, again, I was in housing for 18 years. I'm pretty sure I'm the only elected official in the state who was ever sued under CEQA. I know how hard it is. Um, many of the companies who are engaged in building housing, they're kind of doing okay because even with all those regulations, whatever it costs them to get through the process, at the end of the day, if they have a product to sell, they can pretty much set their price. So how we deal with this is going to be, it's going to be hard. There's no magic wand. There's no simple solution. At the end of the day, we have to build more housing. At the end of the day, we have to figure out how to do it in a way that uh, makes uh, the ability to add supply um, in some way uh, uh, driving prices down to where they're affordable. But again, you know, the to where we're starting is decades in the making, 730,000 median home price in our state, 270,000 in Texas. We have a lot of ground to make up. But I think uh, when we talk about the regulatory environment writ, writ large, and again, I know this is something that Professor Ohanian thinks about often. What I, what I like uh, to, to say when I meet with business groups is, Let's rather than kind of ranting, let's get into some of the specifics of what we can do that will make a yeah. difference. Housing is its own very complicated thing. But in terms of labor laws, in terms of, uh, uh, of um, air quality laws that can sometimes change uh, from year to year too quickly, what I tend to hear from business isn't get rid of all the regulation. What I hear is, can you just make it more comprehensive so I know exactly what I'm supposed to do? And can you make sure that where there are duplicative regulations, you can combine these and make it simpler for me? Uh, those are the kinds of things that I tend to hear. So I always welcome specific examples where, again, in my experience in the private sector, you know, we are willing to comply but it was the process of determining exactly what it is that we had to do to comply that often took so much time and effort and created uncertainty. All right, so thank you so much. Uh, I think we'll hear a little bit from Lee. Uh, I appreciate the, the answers so much, and then we'll come back to more general questions. So Lee, do you wanna start off? Thank you. Uh, thanks, thanks so much, John. Um, uh, I, I'd like to share uh, just a handful of slides. Um, so let me go ahead and do that. And uh, yeah, with these slides, I'd like to explain, you know, from my perspective, why I think that some changes in economic policies and a change in the way we view our model of governance, um, you know, might be might be able to be a game changer within our state and and uh, and increase quality of life uh, for almost everyone. So the way I'm gonna do that is by comparing, you know, kind of two Californias, the California, uh, the California of the post-war, um, of the post-war uh, economic boom and what governance was like then, and then compare the California uh, that's been, that we've had since, you know, the 1980s um, and how governance has changed and policies have changed and now economic performance has changed. So let me begin with uh, just a walk back in time uh, to California after World War II. It's just a remarkable story. Um, California's population rose from you know, six, plus, six plus million in the 1940s to 23 million by the mid 1970s. So the growth was just extraordinary. And this was growth in which our population was uh, about half of our population was less than 24 years old, meaning that tax revenue is really scarce. On an inflation adjusted per capita basis, our budget back in the 1950s, early 1960s was about one fifth of what it is today. But despite those scarce resources, 
our, our, uh, our state and local governments made it possible to support that type of population growth, which, which I view as, as one in which California was the go-to destination. People wanted to be here because of the remarkable natural amenities that California offers and a model of governance that made it feasible and affordable for that to happen. And despite those limited budgets, uh, an enormous amount of the budget was invested. Um, 35 as much as 35% was invested during the years of Governor Pat Brown, the early 1960s. The, it was done remarkably well and, and efficiently. That was a time of huge water and transportation infrastructure investments building of schools that turned out to be the best schools in the country at that time. We delivered the master plan for higher education. We had affordable housing, despite the fact that there was so much increase in demand. The California housing price premium, that's you know the average price of California housing relative to the rest of the country, averaged about just about 35% between 1940 and 1970 with no trend because supply was able to keep up with demand. And California created a number of high paying jobs in the, in the early 1960s, per capita income in the state was 27% higher than the rest of the country. And this is the time when the, when the term, the California dream was coined. It, it seemed like you know, anything and everything was, was possible in California. And, and, and as a child at that time, you know, I certainly benefited from that. So let me just talk for a moment about you know what was the model of governance then, um, and I sort and I see that as kind of a blueprint for success in which principles can be can be used today to help us think about different kinds of policies. And what I've done on this slide is I've reproduced some quotes from Governor Pat Brown's budget statements and gubernatorial speeches around that time. And as we look at these quotes, we see just a lot of really good applications of economic ideas and public finance. And the principles there were prioritize in terms of what people really wanted, make investments to deliver that, and then do it really, really efficiently. So as we look at these quotes, you see implicitly understanding the importance of trade-offs, understanding the implicit importance of cost-benefit logic and the need to be efficient. So we can take a look at these quotes. Uh, one quote is, we must invest to accommodate our magnificent growth. We must prioritize what people need. And in terms of efficiency, he remarked, we can't abuse taxpayers. We must use their precious tax dollars wisely. And at that time, based on the research I've done, there really seemed to be a shared bipartisan vision across political leaders of highly focused government, highly functional governance that made it possible to deliver public goods and services that people really valued at a very efficient, at a very, in a very efficient way. And uh, so now let's take a look at California's economy now, but really this, this, is, this is about California's economy over several decades. So California had this enormous population growth after post-World after uh, World War II, they've continued for several decades. Uh, since 1990, um, there have been three and a half million more Californians that have left the state than those who have come in from other states in the United States. A big reason, um, Eleni mentioned um, housing prices and the median priced home in the state right now, uh, based on uh, California Association of Realtor data is $720,000 for a single family home, around $530,000 for a condominium. Um, so there's just nothing else in, in LA mentioned what the prices were like in Texas. So California is really an outlier uh, in terms of housing costs. And an important corollary of that is that many people in, in the state are struggling. The Census Bureau estimates that 14 million um, are near or below the poverty line. Housing costs are an important reason why. Our budget today, inflation adjusted per person is about five times as high as the budgets in the days of Governor Pat Brown. 
But sadly, um, some basic government functions haven't been getting done over these decades. The Society of Civil Engineers grades our infrastructure with uh, a grade of D. Um, we see inefficiencies within some state and local government departments, such as um, our employment and development department, which has struggled with fraudulent unemployment claims during the pandemic. Uh, about $30 billion worth of fraudulent claims have gone through this system. And unfortunately, there've been many legitimate unemployment claims that have been held up for months um, as the department tries to fix uh, their IT systems, um, which is being run on, uh, on COBOL, which is a 60 year old um, software language and computer system that's about 30 years old. Um, and when we, think about, um, when we think about these statistics more broadly, I think about this from the standpoint of economic policies uh, that, that have been deteriorating you know, for, for decades. This, this, this did not happen overnight. Um, and you know, one symptomatic aspect of that is that our tax and regulatory policies are ranked near the bottom of US states. Um, these rankings are done by nonpartisan non research associations such as the Tax Foundation. So, you know, in terms of solutions, what should we do? Well, in my, from my perspective, we should go back to the principles about economic policymaking that worked so well for us back during a very rapid growth period. Um, so I might call these the Governor Pat Brown principles. Uh, prioritize on basis of what people really want. Invest <clears throat> to make that happen. Our share of investment in the budget is no longer near the share that we had back in the 1960s and 1970s. Um, efficiency, make sure that revenue goes far and ground this on the basis of market principles. And we saw those market principles, you know, being, you know, taking an active role in those quotes from Pat Brown. So from my perspective, increasing accountability and changing incentives within government organizations, within our departments can make a big difference. Um, in 2017, the Oroville Dam uh, in Northern California failed. About, almost 200,000 people had to be evacuated. The cost of repair was 1.1 billion. Yet for years before that, there had been reports and warning signs that the dam needed some retrofitting, probably at a cost of somewhere around 20, 25, 30 million dollars in comparison to 1.1 billion that ultimately had to be paid. From where I stand, if we have the appropriate level of accountability and incentives in place, something like the Oroville Dam failure doesn't happen. Uh, something like what's going on with our employment department, which is still using 60-year-old software and a 30-year-old IT system. If accountability and incentives are in place, you know, that, that doesn't happen. That, that, would, that would have been upgraded a long, long time ago. And I really see one and two going hand in hand in terms of creating a more efficient model within state and local government. I also see regulatory and tax policies having, you know, being competitive with other states. The fact that we've been losing people to other states relative to bringing people in for 30 years means that we need to be competitive. And then fourthly, pension reforms. We did some important reforms back in 2012 under, under uh, Governor Jerry Brown. And then also compensation review of state and local government employees. This really goes hand in hand with points one and two. Um, the meet based on a survey of 2 million state and local government workers, total compensation in the public sector is about twice as high as in the private sector in California. And that's not to suggest an overpayment, but it does suggest the importance of re reviewing the policies and trying to make sure that the right types of incentives and accountability are in place. And from my perspective, if we can make progress on these four items, 
we can build more housing at much lower prices. We can make more investments and improve our infrastructure. We can improve our K through 12 schools, which right now are ranked about 38th in the country after being ranked first in the 1950s and 1960s. We can improve those statistics on poverty. And we can generally make the state the type of dream destination that it was back in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s when, when I grew up as Californian. And as a kid, it seemed like you know anything and everything was possible. So I'll go ahead, uh, I'll go ahead and stop there. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Lee. I, I want to just uh, start off uh, by asking a couple questions. Uh, first, there's other states. I was born in New York. I lived a long time in New Jersey. They're, they're worse by the data. More people are leaving. Connecticut as well. So it, so it sounds like it's not just this, or unless they're the same. So it's one thing if you could address that a little bit. And, and another related thing is related to the, what the Lieutenant Governor said, this medium we're using now, Zoom, uh, the founder is just a couple of miles from this house, Eric Wan, and uh, it's growing like mad. So I don't know if, if you wanna say a little bit, so the other, other side of this a little bit, if you could, thank you. Yeah, yeah. So there's still remarkable benefits um, within the state that uh, Alni mentioned and that you've mentioned and that we can really springboard off of. In terms of the other states that are losing population, such as New York, Connecticut, New Jersey, Illinois is another, um, there's some, there's are some interesting commonalities there. So in several of those states, there's costs of living challenges. In several of those states, there are pension funding problems. Um, uh, in some states, uh, even worse than what we have in California. And when we look at where people are tending to leave from and go to, they tend to be from states that high cost of living, job creation, high paying job creation is limited. Schools are not performing very well at the public level. And they're going to places such as Idaho, Florida, <clears throat> Texas, Utah, where cost of living is much lower. Pension issues aren't as much of an issue. Uh, pens pensions aren't as much of an issue. School performance and better. So we are seeing a pattern about who's leaving from where and where they're going. And then you brought the uh, the idea of Zoom. So what's remarkable about California Silicon Valley is that it's still the place to start a tech business. Most of the country's venture capital is here in California primarily in Silicon Valley and San Francisco. So there's no better place to start a tech business um, than right here, which is what, which is what Zoom did. Um, Zoom is still a very young company. They, um, they just started recording revenue, you know, roughly two and a half or three years ago. And what we need to make sure of is that we can keep them here once they're ready to fly the nest. Um, so that's what I, that's what I see is the, uh, is the issue as these tech firms mature, then they're, they no longer need the startup advantages of what Silicon Valley and Silicon Valley, uh, venture capital can provide. So we need to be able to keep these mature firms here, uh, rather than just gestate them and grow them and then watch them leave once they're in a position to do that. So one, one more general question, the, it's uh, both you and Lieutenant Governor mentioned is that th this may be a harbinger for the country, you know, how we're doing compared to other countries in the world. And that's a, that's a huge topic of consideration. Is there, are there analogies here, Lee, that you see that uh, we should be watchful for the whole country that maybe California, some of the other states may be indicating? Well, I mean, personally, I, I still see, on average, the U.S. as the best place to do business in the world. Um, as the global economy evolves and as patterns of comparative advantage change over time, 
we'll see evolutions and shifts in what's produced here versus what's produced in other countries. And that's a healthy change from the standpoint of, of, of economics. Um, China was the go-to destination to try to be able to access low-cost labor for many years. Um, the you know, median U.S. worker productivity is still four times as high as that of a Chinese worker. And the low cost advantages um, of using labor in China are rising, wages there are rising. So uh, if we make the right decisions at the national level in terms of policies, I, I think we're, we're still gonna be the place to be for doing business. Um, and, um, you know, I, so I, I, I hope our national leaders make the, right, make the right choices in terms of budgets and tax policy and regulatory policy and immigration policy um, <clears throat> to, to, to uh, bounce off of the Lieutenant Governor's comment about immigration. Some of the most remarkable businesses we've started in California and in the country have been by immigrants. Uh, Elon Musk from South Africa, Sergey Brin from Russia, uh, you go back to the 1950s and Andy Grove, who started Intel, um, was from Hungary. Um, so we, we, need, we need more Sergey Brins and Andy Groves and Elon Musk's here. Thank you very much, Lee. Let's, let's throw it open to questions of both Lee and Lieutenant Governor. Uh, I, I'd like to uh, call on uh, Tyler Goodspeed first. Tyler has just spent some time in Washington. He's coming back to California. So do you have a question, Tyler? Uh, sure, uh, great to join everyone. Um, I, I found it curious to hear both about um, restoring the state and local tax deduction and mortgage interest deduction, and also about uh, a lot of concerns about housing affordability in, in the Golden State. Uh, and so I was just interested in particularly how Lee thinks about the interaction between tax policy and housing prices, because one of the things that a lot of recent empirical literature finds is that those state and local tax deductions and mortgage interest deductions are actually capitalized into housing prices particularly in very supply inelastic markets, like for example, the Bay Area. Uh, and so one thing that we've observed since the, the, the 2017 tax changes that limited those deductions is that we've, while home ownership rates have risen across the board, they've risen by the most in, in those states and, and municipalities which were previously relying most intensively uh, on the, the state and local and mortgage interest tax deductions. Uh, so I'd just be curious to hear particularly uh, from, from, from Lee about how he thinks about the interaction of, of the, the, those deductions uh, with housing affordability, um, because basically what the, the recent empirical evidence seems to suggest uh, is that tax expenditures that disproportionately benefit accrue to the highest income tax filers uh, uh, were in fact pricing out non-incumbents in, in, in housing markets. Thank you both. Um, yeah, in response to, to Tyler's question, um, no, I, I, I agree with that economic logic um, completely. What, what is puzzling to me is that, you know, after that tax reform is passed, I expected to start seeing that, you know, impacting the equilibrium price of housing in California. Um, you know, it, either we haven't seen it yet or it's being buried in other forces that are driving up home prices, one of which is, um, is mortgage rates. Um, so, you know, from a personal standpoint, I'm refining a jumbo mortgage in California, um, no cost at, at two and five eighths percent, uh, which, which is hard for me to believe. Uh, after inflation and after the tax deduction that I have um, is kind of, you know, I'm basically have a, have a zero borrowing cost. Uh, so I think that is probably responsible for some of the push in California home prices. Um, setters, parabs, all things equal, that should absolutely be affecting California home prices. Um, you know, they're still high. Uh, maybe they would be higher. Uh, than, than if that uh, tax form had not taken place. But um, 
Yeah, their uh, median price is somewhere in twenty thousand dollars, and it doesn't look like it's going to be going down at least, you know, at least right now. Um, uh, building supply, um, Governor Newsom uh, announced when he when in in his uh, in his inaugural address, he spoke about the importance of really expanding housing supply. And a uh, back of the envelope calculation I did recently suggests that we're um, about. 80 to 85 percent below what his target is for building. So that's another factor. We have another another question from a person who spent time in Washington recently. He's back in California. And uh, Josh, you want to say something, Josh Rao? Yeah. In fact, Tyler and I are reunited on this call. Great, great to see you, Tyler. Um, so thanks very much uh, to uh, to Lee, who is my colleague at Hoover as well, and thank you very much, Lieutenant Governor. Actually, my my, my questions were for you, Lieutenant Governor. Um, so so uh, two two uh, two questions. First of all, you you cited evidence that you know people leaving San Francisco, many of them were staying in California. Um, that's heartening. Um, I think the question, based on the other statistic that you cited about um, the percentage of revenues that are that are generated by the top one percent is you know high income people to what extent has their departure from the state increased and where are they going um in the work that i've done with the data from the the franchise tax board um it you know predates the covid era but when people left and they started leaving in increasing numbers after prop 30 uh, they were going in large numbers to Texas, Nevada, and Florida. So I guess the first question, sir, what do we, do we, do you know anything additional about where people who are leaving the state now, who are high income people are going? And the, the second question is related to the, the point that you made about the Silicon Valley uh, employment workforce being flat. Um, I think unfortunately flat is not a very good benchmark because the fact is that COVID actually was a tremendous positive shock to the employment opportunities of and the prospects of the technology sector in the United States. And you know, for that reason, that's why we've seen the technology sector really booming. And I think that flat is not the right benchmark. The right benchmark is why is it that if you look at the most recent data from the BLS of employment, total employment in the economy, you know, why is it that we saw actual increases from 20 20 over 2019, December 2020 over 2019, despite COVID in Austin, Nashville, Memphis, Denver, Salt Lake City, and Dallas. Um, you know, uh, given California, given Silicon Valley's emphasis on uh, technology, uh, we should have done a lot better. Well, look, uh, Josh, I, I do not know. I have not seen any numbers of exactly where the 1% end up going. I, I think that most of us you know, hear a lot of anecdotal evidence, but I thought that the USPS study was interesting because I hadn't seen an analysis. Uh, I don't think there is another analysis out there that can actually say, okay, you know, we have collected the change of address forms. We can tell you that I think the county where Austin is in Texas was 18th on the list of people who filed a change of address forms from San Francisco County to another county. Uh, but I think that what we know is people go all over. Um, many people come here seeking their fortune. Uh, and when they're given the opportunity to move back to either the home state or another state where they might have relations, uh, they might go. I, I talk to tax attorneys, I think that uh, the that if you have somewhere you might prefer to live anyway that has a lower um, personal income tax to California and you are mobile and can leave, uh, it might be very appealing. I, I think though, Josh, the real question is, you know, what if anything can we do about it? Remote work has absolutely transformed uh, where people live. And uh, again, I actually am very encouraged when I see techies leaving San Francisco and moving to the California side of Lake Tahoe. And a lot of them are. Uh, you know, there are all kinds of, you know, stories of big tech uh, founders buying big mansions on Lake Tahoe on the California side. 
So um, I think part of it is if they thought it would be easy to go to the Nevada side while still having their company in California, they might do it. But we actually do have protection so that people can't sort of pretend to live out of California when they really their equities are really here. So, um, uh, but I, I think like many things, COVID has accelerated the kinds of trends that we were seeing already. And remote work is a very significant one of those. So again, when you go back to home prices, as well as personal income tax, uh, there are going to be people who given the opportunity to live elsewhere will do it. Um, but again, I, I guess what I'm looking at when I'm looking at the Silicon Valley numbers is that does it look like an exodus? Does it quack like an exodus? Or are we seeing adjustments that based on the traditional kind of cycles of California's booms and busts going back to the gold rush are not beyond what we can handle. And that's why I point to our infrastructure. And Lee, I agree, you know, Republicans fought the gas tax tooth and nail, but we got it. Uh, the Democrats, unlike Trump, who did not put forward any kind of meaningful infrastructure plan for the US, this is the Biden administration's top priority. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, between education, transportation, then of course, are very forward leaning investments into clean tech that frankly created the market for Elon Musk to create Tesla in our state. Uh, so I look to those things when I try to think about long-term, whether or not we're going to be able to weather the storm, which, which again, I, I'm not denying that there are people who are leaving and that the issues that Lee points to aren't real because I, I think that they are. The question is the scope and the scale and whether or not, as you know, I borrowed from the governor, what's good about California uh, is enough to fix uh, the challenges ahead. Uh, and I'm, I'm not an economist, Josh. I, I hope I answered your question. So uh, we have a question from Mike Boskin and, and then Dick Kovacevic, I see is raising his hand. So Mike and then Dick. Thank you, Eleni. Thank you, Lee, for excellent presentations. Eleni, I wanna uh, say, appreciate what you had to say about immigrants. Uh, we should be, you know, we're the first minor a majority minority state and it would be good if we spent a lot more time figuring out how to, ways to make that a competitive advantage in a global economy rather than barking at each other. So that's good. Also appreciated what you said about trying to make greater efficiencies in higher education. A foundation I run has poured millions of dollars into CCSF and um, the Peralta Colleges in East Bay to map uh, their courses into specific majors at the main four-year colleges they go to. So more and more of their students will show up more as juniors, not as sophomores, because they don't have their courses don't map into their majors. So all, the, all those are useful. I argued for years with three governors of California that they should be pushing being able to wheel units across campuses and CSU system to break this bottleneck of people not being able to take the last class they need allegedly is important. But I wanna raise, I wanna pick up on something Lee said and raise something, which is I think if you did a survey of Californians about whether they think the government is effectively and efficiently dispensing the basic services of government, the answers would be pretty depressing. Lee mentioned the, uh, what I would call the misnamed employment development department. Um, uh, another big example is we have basically no new water storage capacity as the population has doubled in recent decades. And we'll probably have another drought before long, maybe even uh, later this year. Um, there's an immense amount of deferred maintenance and accruing unfunded liabilities in the pension system. And if we had accrual accounting, I don't think the budget would be $15 billion in surplus. It might, it might leaven whether we should be spending that money or dealing with the deferred maintenance in our infrastructure, for example. Um, so I, th I think my basic question is, um, how do you get a more sensible set of information before our, before our elected leaders and the population that includes things like deferred maintenance, includes things, I mean, 
the basic things that any normal, any serious operating agency would uh, would have with a separate capital budget. Um, you know, the 60 year old IT infrastructure, things of that sort. And that I think would focus, and I think it would be very timely to do something like that because it would focus on where the high return projects really are in infrastructure, which every serious uh, research study suggests are in uh, maintenance and repairs, not in shiny new projects with ribbon cuttings and huzzahs like uh, the mixed speed rail debacle that's formerly known as the bullet train. Um, so I'm just wondering why we don't hear more of that, why we don't see that, and what can be done about providing that information. So uh, let me, since we're almost out of time, Dick, do you want to make a comment? And then whatever time there is, we'll, we'll hear from Lee and Lenny. Dick? I think we missed some very important points that the Lieutenant Governor needs to hear. First of all, post office is not the determination. As you know, if you live in California for less than six months, uh, you don't pay uh, taxes in California. And so you have a several, a, 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 a great deal of wealthy people that are paying 60% of the taxes who keep a residence in California, but they're not paying taxes in California because they're out of California more than six months. And that there is no question that the main reason people are leaving is by high personal taxes compared to any other state and they only have to go to their second home in Idaho or, or uh, Nevada or whatever and pay zero or low or, or, or not much. And as Josh has done in a report, it, uh, in 2013 and 14, only two years after the uh, passage of the, of the uh, Brown uh, tax initiative, uh, the amount of revenue uh, collected was 57% less than was expected because people were moving out and people are still moving out. And I don't know, <laughs> uh, Josh is working on some information to show that more so. And you don't look at Silicon Valley where someone's headquarters are, look at the fact that they are not expanding. And they're expanding in all other states, again, because of the personal income tax rates on their employees. And, and if we don't change that, or if, and, and the threat that is out there today, because they're still moving out, is that the, uh, is we're gonna raise income taxes. And unless the governor uh, says that he is against any increase in, in, in personal income taxes, they're still gonna move. And you're gonna have less revenue, even though you're increasing taxes. So Dick, let me start by saying some people have their second homes right here in California in the desert, like your son, who's my neighbor down there. <laughs> um, but my, my son doesn't have a house in, in the no, desert. No, um, my husband Marcos, I thought just texted me that you're Marty's father. No. Oh, sorry, sorry, my apologies. Maybe someone else. Okay, I should leave that. But let me just say, I, I think you might have missed uh, what I said in my remarks. I am not denying that people are leaving the state or that the high taxes are a reason for it. I said that right out in front. I'm not denying it. What we're trying to do is a conversation here that goes beyond this, um, you know, the, the, the idea that we can go back to something. And Lee, I appreciate your respect for Governor Brown. Uh, I met him when I was a kid. My dad knew him. Uh, mm -hmm. My father was a waiter in Pat Brown's mansion when he was mm -hmm. governor. That was my dad going around with the drinks. And many years later, I wrote a letter of recommendation to Dartmouth for Pat Brown's granddaughter. <laughs> so I have great respect for the family, but we're not going back. And if anybody wants to get a glimpse of the reality of California, come and visit me in the Capitol when we open back up again. I worked in the Capitol in 1984 when I was an intern for Senator Nick Petras. Back then, I didn't look around and see other women, brown haired, five foot two, scurrying around working in the Capitol. Now, it's, it, it's a different reality here and we're not going to go back. So the question is, 
what does our future really look like? And the reality is that taxpayers are leaving, but people are continuing to come in. This churn that I talked about is a reality. Now, is it ideal? No, but so long as we can draw the lens back on California and recognize that there are things about our state, whether it's our location on the Pacific Rim, whether it's having the largest land border crossing in the world with Mexico, whether it's the fact that 40% of all the containerized cargo that comes into the United States comes through our ports, whether it's the fact that we have the CSU, the UC and the community college system with 3 million students currently enrolled and all this energy of the immigrant and first generation kids with this open society that draws the whole world uh, into wanting to come to California, whether it's as a tourist, tourism is actually being down right now is the thing that's hurting us really almost more than anything economically right now. Um, but all of that is permanent. And so how do we do the best that we can? I guess what I would really uh, point to Lee, you know, I went, uh, up and visited after the near tragedy at Oroville Dam. I went up and I and I toured it. Uh, it's a pretty it's a pretty extraordinary system. It, it, the a description that it was just crumbling and ready to collapse and nobody did anything about it. I actually don't think that that's accurate. Uh, what I do see, however, is that our ability to invest in our infrastructure is key. And the way that the state is investing right now is through our budget priorities. We have a $15 billion budget surplus. We have the largest budget that we've ever had. What did the governor do as his top priority? Replenish the rainy day fund. Because we don't know if next year or the year after will be as good. We don't know what those 1% of taxpayers or all those companies that are going public, we don't know what it's gonna be like. So putting money into the rainy day fund insulates us and helps us. The second piece of enormous pru uh, fiscal prudency is $9 billion to pay down pension obligations, 3 billion a year. I think that's pretty smart, pretty prudent uh, way to deal with this surplus. And then beyond that, going after the sector of the state that has been hurt the most by the pandemic, small businesses, $2 billion in grants for small businesses to help those companies that have managed to survive, be able to get on their feet and weather the storm. I guess what I'm saying here is that I hear everything you have to say, but the answer isn't, how do we go back to the old days? The answer is, how do we do the best that we can with the tools that we have and the benefits uh, of, uh, that California has, has been able to offer people. Uh, again, going back to the remarks uh, and the things that I outlined in my opening comments. Uh, thank you so much. Let's have a quick re response from Lee and then we have to stop because we're over time. So Lee, quickly. Okay, yeah, thanks uh, Thanks so much, John. And uh, thank you, Lieutenant Governor, for your uh, remarks. Um, just to touch briefly on the failure of the Oroville Dam, there were reports in uh, 2005 and 2013 um, focusing on the, uh, the, the, uh, the dangers that needed to be addressed. Um, and then in terms of um, uh, Lieutenant Governor's remarks about how do we do our best? Um, I think that the issues of efficiency and incentives and accountability and prioritizing on the basis of what the majority of citizens really, really want, I think that's how we do our best. And the governments uh, back in the 1960s and 1970s of California show just how remarkable of a job that can be done when incentives and accountability and efficiency are front and center. So if when we think about, um, yes, the composition of the population looks much different, absolutely. But efficiency and incentives and accountability, um, those never go out of style. So, and I think a lot of the challenges we see right now ranging from building low income housing for $700 per square foot, when the national average is closer to 150, 
to the other issues we see now with the employment department uh, and uh, high-speed rail, I just see that those are, in some sense, low-hanging fruit that we can make remarkable progress on with, with, some, uh, with some policy changes. So thank you so much. I can see we're still discussing the facts and still discussing the reasons, let alone the solutions, but it's been very beneficial. Appreciate Lee and Ellen. I wish we could hear Steve Davis, Rick Hanushek, Elena Pesterino, and Bob Hall, but we can't. We have to stop. So thank you both so much. John, if I can just say that from time to time, my husband lets me go with him uh, to sit in the little cafe or little uh, greeting area that you have. And I always love it because uh, you never know who's going to wander in. Uh, I see my favorite general, uh, General Mattis, is yes. on this Zoom. It's wonderful to see you, General. Uh, but, uh, uh, but I do hope to be down there visiting as soon as things open up again. And I always welcome every one of your challenges, uh, every one of your ideas, and an open dialogue. Uh, I love this state, and I have no doubt that most, if not every one of you on this call feels the exact same way. It's a great way to end. Thank you all. Thank you. And especially thanks to Marcus. <laughs>